Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea maintains a complex relationship with the United States. While many South Koreans remain grateful for their liberation from Japanese rule in 1945 and consider proximity with the United States a catalyst for security and prosperity, others believe the US often behaves as a condescending hegemon and that its military presence is preventing Korean reunification from ever taking place. As a result, South Korea is a country where several anti-American demonstrations took place, but where at the same time, US Ambassador Mark Lippert received outpours of support when he was assaulted by a knife-wielding man in March 2015. To make sense of this dichotomy, we had the pleasure of hosting for this episode David Straub, the author of the recently published book Anti-Americanism in Democratizing South Korea, which focuses on anti-American protests between 1999 and 2002. David Straub is the Associate Director of the Korea Program at Stanford University's Walter Shorenstein Asia-Pacific Research Center. He retired in 2006 from his role as a U.S. senior diplomat after a 30-year career focused on Northeast Asia. He worked over 12 years on Korean affairs, first arriving in Seoul in 1979. Among various distinguished postings, Mr. Straub served as head of the political section at the U.S. Embassy in Seoul from 1999 to 2002 during popular protests against the United States and he played a key working-level role in the six-party talks on North Korea's nuclear program as the State Department's Korea Country Desk Director from 2002 to 2004. He has published a number of papers on U.S.-Korean relations and is fluent in both Korean and Japanese. David Straub, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you very much, my pleasure. What brought you initially to South Korea? I came to South Korea in 1979 to work at the American Embassy. I had joined the State Department in 1976, and after my first posting to Germany, I wanted to go to some place else that was dynamic, but a different region, and ideally a place where I could learn a hard language while I was still relatively young. So I told the personnel section I would love to work in Northeast Asia, China, Japan, or Korea, They called back and said, have we got a deal for you? We'll give you a year's language training at Yonsei University. Then you can work at the embassy's consular section, issuing visas and practice your Korean in that, and then work another two years in the political section. So I said, wonderful. The topic of today's interview is anti-Americanism in South Korea. How did you get interested in that topic? Well, I've worked in South Korea at the American Embassy twice, uh, from 1979 to 84, and then again, the subject of the book, from 1999 to 2002. And both times, Korean feelings about the United States were rather strong. 1979 was uh, the year in which President Park was assassinated, and Chun Doo Hwan, a general, began a rolling coup d'etat and eventually took full power in Korea. And the following year, the Kwangju incident, the Kwangju tragedy occurred, which I think helped to shape the views of a generation of Koreans, the so-called 386 generation, toward America, critical views. And then the second time I worked at the embassy, we saw some of the biggest demonstrations against the U.S. perhaps ever, especially in the year 2002. So let's start with recent events. In March, a self-processed nationalist attacked the American ambassador to South Korea, Mark Lippert, with a knife and cut up his face, as well as his hand. Is that an isolated event, or is that part of a wider context? That particular event was quite isolated, I think. I believe it reflects mostly the emotional and mental state of this person. Obviously, what he did was was quite extreme and certainly is not supported by even Koreans that uh, I might call anti-American in inclination. But it was interesting that he was lecturing for several years about the United States and about North-South Korean relations in uh, South Korean government-affiliated educational institutions. I've never seen an explanation as to how someone with such apparent emotional problems was able to get and keep such uh, lecture jobs. 
A decade earlier, a pediatrician and physicist of the American army was also attacked in the street by a homeless man, and he was killed. Was that also an isolated event, or did it take part into a wider frame? That was also unique in a large sense. However, it did take place in a framework. I arrived here in 1999 to begin work at the embassy, and that was a time when the South Korean media increasingly focused on criticism of the United States, especially U.S. forces Korea. And by the time the incident occurred in 2000, by the time this murder occurred in 2000, the general atmosphere in Korea toward the United States and USFK in particular was quite harsh. When mentally disturbed people engage in violence, it usually reflects their mental illness, the availability of some kind of a weapon, and the cultural milieu in which they find themselves. So I do think that the widespread critical attitudes toward the United States during that period probably influenced his decision to suddenly attack this man that he knew nothing about. Before going any further, could you maybe explain what anti-Americanism means in the South Korean context and what are the main requests it has? In South Korea, I think anti-Americanism is part of a broader issue that many Koreans have, perhaps more so in the past, of trying to make sense of the outside world, of people who aren't Koreans. The Americans uh, at times have been a particular focus because since 1945, the United States uh, has been so salient in the lives of South Koreans. We have a large military, we had a large military presence in South Korea, still have some. The United States occupied South Korea after 1945, led the international response to the invasion of Korea, and then helped Korea with its economic development, among many other things. So for many Koreans, the United States is a real reference point for both emulation and for criticism. I don't really have a definition of anti-Americanism in my book because in doing the research into the academic literature, I found that nobody agrees on, on what it means. It's too vague to be really a useful social science concept. So for me, I guess anti-Americanism means if a person from your own country does X, do you react to that in the same way that you do when a person from country Y uh, does the same thing? And I write about many incidents in the book in which Americans did something and the Korean reaction to it is far more focused and far more critical than it would have been if it had been a Korean or a Korean institution doing the same thing. So in the case of South Korea, what is advocated by those people? What type of changes would they like to see? It's probably important to distinguish between those Koreans who, for political or ideological reasons, have been fairly consistently critical and sometimes one could say anti-American, and the average South Korean who normally doesn't think that much about the United States and is not doesn't have an ideological basis for the criticism. It's more of an issue of a people who, until modern times, were fairly isolated, trying to make sense of people from other areas. But there is a long-standing ideological basis in South South Korea to take a very critical attitude toward the United States, if not anti-Americanism in particular. And this stems from the tragic history of the Korean Peninsula over the last hundred years. Uh, the fact that South Korea was a victim of the imperialist powers competition, ultimately Japan won that and colonized Korea, that was traumatic for the Korean people. The fact that the United States uh, unintentionally it divided the Korean Peninsula more or less permanently and then occupied the country, all of these uh, things went into the making of a traumatic time in recent Korean history. And naturally enough, Korean people try to find explanations for this. Um, naturally enough, many Koreans would like to find entities to blame, and sometimes it's easier to blame foreign entities rather than what one's own people have done to contribute to the situation. You mentioned the 386 generation. Does anti-Americanism fit with other demographic factors, uh, gender, age, level of education? 
The, the 386 generation, I think, is an important phenomenon because these are the people who were going to college basically around 1979 and, and 1980, and they have the very strong impression that the United States government supported the rise of Chen Du Huan and was at least tacitly responsible for the tragedy in Guangzhou. So generationally speaking, that is an important factor. I don't see real gender differences. Uh, in opinion polls, educated people tend to be somewhat more critical of the United States, perhaps because they read more about the details of the relationship, and it's probably natural that in a democracy, the media would take an us versus them approach, and so intellectuals tend to be somewhat more critical. I wouldn't necessarily call that anti-Americanism, though. There was some tendency towards anti-Americanism regionally in earlier years. Kwangju is in the Chala area of southeastern Korea, and I think because of the perceptions of the U.S. role in the Kwangju events that people from the Chalas were, for a time at least, more critical perhaps of the United States than people from other regions of Korea. What about in terms of political spectrum? Is the left more anti-American or is it more a right-side phenomenon? Both left and right in South Korea are quite nationalistic, and the conservatives in South Korea can often be extremely critical of the United States. But ideologically speaking, the left, or, or progressives as they prefer to call themselves in South Korea, tend to be more consistently critical of the United States, and sometimes I think it really verges into anti-Americanism. For English uh, readers, I would say that you might compare the attitudes of a lot of South Korean progressives toward the United States with those of, say, Noam Chomsky, that the United States um, has played a sort of quasi-imperialist role in uh, modern world affairs and that the U.S. Is, can often be quite hypocritical. So let's zoom in a bit on your book. One focus lies on what can arguably be described as the largest outpouring of anti-American sentiments in recent Korean history. Can you maybe briefly summarize the events between June and December 2002? Yes, in June 2002, there was a traffic accident involving a U.S. military convoy involved in a military exercise. The convoy was traveling along a road and one of the vehicles in the convoy accidentally struck two Korean schoolgirls who were walking along the side of the road. It crushed them and they died immediately. It was a terrible tragedy. This was immediately recognized by the leadership of U.S. Forces Korea and of the U.S. Embassy as not only a tragedy, but something with the potential to be very emotionally received by the Korean people. And so the American embassy and USFK leaders immediately contacted their counterparts in the Korean government and offered condolences and regrets. They contacted the family. They provided initial burial money and promises of compensation and so forth. Ironically, the Korean media and the Korean people at that time paid very little attention to all of this because it was in the midst of the 2002 World Cup championship which was being co-hosted by Korea and Japan. And in Korea, the Korean team was doing well and there was a, a popular celebrations and game watching on the streets and everyone was having a wonderful time. When the World Cup ended, though, all of a sudden the media realized something significant had happened, and they began reporting on it as if the United States had been completely callous about this, and as if the traffic accident somehow symbolized the disrespect of the U.S. forces Korea for the Korean people. So there was a great deal of critical commentary, very, very harsh critical commentary about the United States and USFK in the Korean media in the weeks and months after that. The Korean media demanded an investigation, they demanded a, a trial and so forth, by, a trial by Korean courts. Eventually the United States military conducted a court martial and in November the two people in the vehicle that ran over the two girls were declared not guilty. Well, this set off an even bigger firestorm, which eventually resulted in some of the largest protests against the United States that have ever been seen in South Korea. To me, this is the climax of this, a series of issues and controversies that sort of began in Korea in 1999. 
it also, I think, dramatically symbolized how Koreans had become so jaundiced toward the United States during this period that they could imbue a traffic accident with so much symbolism and so much meaning. If one thinks about it for a moment, every day in Korea there are scores of traffic accidents. South Korea has one of the world's highest traffic fatality rates, and yet most Koreans thought that this symbolized American disrespect and callousness toward them. So you mentioned that this was the climax of a multi-year buildup. What started this process? One of the things that happened is that I arrived in South Korea to begin my work in the early fall of 1999. But I believe that I'm being fairly objective in saying that it, it appears that the Associated Press, a story about the so-called Nogunni killings or there are massacres even by American soldiers in the opening weeks of the Korean War in 1950, sort of set the South Korean media on a storyline about a revisionist rethinking of what the United States means to us Koreans. So between the fall of 1999, it seemed that the Korean media couldn't get its fill of anything that they could take and use to criticize the United States, especially U.S. versus Korea. So between 1999 and 2002, there were a host of major issues that were highlighted by the South Korean media involving the United States. And each issue or incident seemed to make the Korean media even more eager to find other stories which they could play up. Of course, in the meantime, the Korean people were reading this and were becoming more and more emotional and disturbed about it. This was the only information they were getting. So this seemed of great significance. But I write about in the book that many of these incidents were either taken out of context or exaggerated or imbued with a meaning far out of any bounds of rationality. You actually mentioned that some of the controversies were based on widely fictional events. Could you tell us more about that and why they were actually believed so widely? The incident at the village of Meihang or Meihang Ni is a very interesting case study. That is a village that is located next to a U.S. Forces Korea Air Force target practice facility. And the U.S. forces had been using it, I guess, ever since the Korean War. It's the only place in Korea that the U.S. military has to practice its skills and to, so as to be ready in case uh, North Korea ever invades again. Unfortunately, it's very close to the village, and the village has gotten more populous as the years have gone on. So it's become a, a bigger problem for the villagers. It's uh, noisy, it could be dangerous, and so forth. There was a village activist who had long been trying to get this facility closed down. And during this period, an American Air Force airplane had mechanical difficulties, and following standard operating procedures, it dropped its bombs on the far side of an island in the Yellow Sea off the coast of the village. The village activist immediately reported that this had caused tremendous damage, that older people had been injured, that hundreds of houses had their foundations cracked, uh, doors and windows were broken, and so on and so forth. The Korean media reported this completely uncritically. And of course, the result was that there was a great deal of outrage with editorials and commentaries saying this was typical of the Americans and their arrogance and their disrespect for the safety of the Korean people. Again, there were demands for an investigation. So the U.S. forces Korea and the South Korean military went down to the village and did a several days long thorough investigation using technical means and interviews and, and lots of other methods. And it became immediately clear that the dropping of those bombs on the far side of an uninhabited island a mile out from the village could not possibly have caused any damage whatsoever to the villagers. So the American and South Korean co-investigators released a report that said we're quite certain there was no damage caused by this incident. Well, this enraged the Korean media. They said, it's very hard for us to believe this, after all we've been told about it. Moreover, we're not upset so much about this particular incident. We're upset that the U.S. has continued to use this practice range, even though it's dangerous, for decades. 
Well, of course, the Korean media was changing the storyline. Before they would say, this incident was a terrible, terrible thing. And suddenly, when there was evidence that nothing had happened, they're saying, but still we were right. You Americans are, are bad. So this was, I think, frankly speaking, I believe that the village activists made this story up entirely because he saw a good opportunity in the climate of, of anti-Americanism that existed at the time. There were a number of other incidents that aren't quite as clear cut, but nevertheless are fairly clear. For example, the mortician at the U.S. Horses Korea mortuary uh, was cleaning house and saw a cache of outdated formaldehyde and, and chemicals used to embalm bodies. And he instructed his staff to dilute it in water and dump it down the drain. Now, by that time, it was no longer accepted U.S. Forces Korea policy, and it was also against Korean regulation to dispose of formaldehyde in that way. But up until a few years before in the United States, and in fact, I believe on the back of the bottles, it said, if you need to dispose of this, dilute it well in water and throw it down the drain. In other words, if it's diluted in water sufficiently, it dissolves and it's no longer toxic. Some of the Korean employees were upset. They went to a left-wing South Korean environmental group, which held a major press conference denouncing this act on the part of U.S. officials of trying to poison the people of Seoul by putting poison in the drinking water in the Han River. And so the outrage was so thorough that all attempts by USFK to say, but we apologize, he did wrong, this was a violation of our policy and your, your regulations, and it won't happen again. On the other hand, please be assured that the scientific evidence is that no one is going to be hurt by this. The South Korean media and public were absolutely unprepared to listen to this, and moreover, their reaction was, how dare you try to justify these unjustifiable acts? This is shameless. Now, that kind of reaction was typical of the media and public reaction toward USFK uh, in regard to most of these incidents throughout those three years. This event with the formal hydride actually led to a movie, The Host. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Very few Koreans today remember the formaldehyde incident, which was a huge incident at the time. But as you say, one of Korea's most famous and best directors made a movie called The Host, I believe, in English. Was it Kwemul in Korean, I believe? And it was very popular in Korea, and it got great critical reviews in New York and, and other places in the United States where it was shown. So almost everybody in Korea remembers the movie The Host, and, and in fact many Americans remember it, but very few remember the origin of this. Are the problems you mentioned, the controversies, always linked to the U.S. forces in Korea? Most of the anti-American feeling during this period was, in fact, directed at USFK, and most of the incidents and issues that were the focus of media attention were related to U.S. forces Korea. But there were some other issues that weren't. In the book, I address two of these. One is the South Korean government and media criticism of the Bush administration for its so-called hardline North Korea policy. This is a bigger issue for the South Korean government than it was for the public. The South Korean president at the time was Kim Dae-jung, and I think he regarded it as his life's mission to try to make progress with North Korea. And he was quite convinced that President George W. Bush's North Korea policy was fundamentally undermining all of his efforts up until then. So he was quite naturally, from his perspective, embittered about this. And this was reflected in, I think, what his top advisors said to the South Korean media, which in turn helped to make the South Korean public upset about George W. Bush. I have an anecdote in the book about the first meeting between the two men in which President Kim tried to persuade the younger George W. Bush to accept his so-called sunshine policy toward North Korea. And of course, Bush did not agree with that. But in the press conference after their meeting, President Bush at the outset referred to Kim Dae-jung as this man. And the uh, Korean media heard the word this man and translated it literally word for word, isaram, which uh, is very rude or can be very rude in Korean. And this uh, was accepted by the Korean media and the Korean public, and I learned later by Kim Dae-jung himself, as uh, being a fact that George W. Bush was intentionally referring to him as, in effect, isaram. Well, it was ridiculous. 
In the United States, we say this man or this person or this woman all the time, and it doesn't necessarily have any negative uh, connotation. Well, it doesn't have any negative connotation. In fact, when we get married, uh, the priest or the pastor will say, do you take this man as your lawfully wedded husband? And a few days ago, when uh, uh, Vice President Biden uh, held a press conference and said he was not going to run for president, his last words uh, to the media was, and I'm going to work the rest of this coming year with this man, in other words, President Obama, to do the best I can to realize my agenda for the United States. But this was a huge issue in South Korea, and it was so huge because South Koreans were already disposed to be so critical. But anyway, that's just one example of the way in which disagreements between the George W. Bush government and the Kim Dae-jung government over North Korea caused a lot of anti-American feeling. The other issue that I deal with that is not USFK related is the 2002 Winter Olympics controversy in which the American Apollo Ono defeated the South Korean hero Kim Dong-sung in short track racing. And I don't know anything about uh, sports and even less about short track racing. So I actually had one of my students at Seoul National University Graduate School of International Studies who wrote uh, a term paper for me on this subject to take his paper and update it and flesh it and explain why this was such a huge controversy in South Korea. And I learned that up until then, the only medals that South Koreans had won in Winter Olympics had all been in short track racing. For, so for South Koreans, short track was really, really important, and Kim was their hero. And so when Apollo Ono won this particular event, due to a call by an Australian umpire, nevertheless, it was held in Utah, and South Koreans said, Huh. This is held in Utah, and a gold medal is given to an American, and by the way, he's a Japanese-American. And so the sports fans and the Korean media were absolutely enraged. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that the anti-American feeling generated by this sporting incident was worse than that caused by all of the other incidents individually that I've written about in the book. At the time, who do you think were the most vocal and the strongest proponents of uh, anti-Americanism, of booting out the American forces? South Korea has a very vibrant civil society, and the civil society played a major and very praiseworthy role in forcing South Korea to democratize in 1987. That said, there are strong elements of radical leftism in part of the South Korean progressive civil society movement. So it is primarily in some progressive civil society organizations that the most active anti-Americanism resided, and I believe the more quietly resides to this day. But even most of them do not openly call for the withdrawal of US forces Korea. And by the way, I'm not defining anti-Americanism as simply Koreans who want U.S. forces to withdraw. I, I believe you can be a conservative or a moderate South Korean and have perfectly reasonable and understandable arguments that maybe Korea doesn't need U.S. forces stationed in Korea anymore. But these organizations in 1999 to 2002 who were focusing on South Korea, I believe in many cases were doing so because they felt that by making U.S. military personnel appear to be criminals and murderous towards South Koreans, that they could undermine the political basis for the continued stationing of U.S. forces in South Korea. In other words, to, to repeat myself, most South Koreans even then wanted U.S. forces to remain in South Korea at least for some time to come. So tactically, it was not practical for anti-American forces, forces that wanted the withdrawal of U.S. military from South Korea, to blatantly, openly call for the withdrawal of U.S. forces. Instead, they tried to portray U.S. forces as an evil force in South Korean society. If you know that by any chance, what were the actual reasons of that vocal minority to want U.S. forces out? Was there a dominant rationale behind it? I think there are long-standing historical and cultural and ideological reasons which I try to lay out in the opening chapter of the book that sort of the, sets the stage for this. 
but because of the traumas that South Korea suffered as a nation in the late 19th and throughout a good part of the 20th century, it's natural that Korean society would be divided politically and that some aspects of Korean society would find South Korea's relationship, if not partial security dependence on the United States, to be, to be offensive. Again, I think that for people who know him, that comparing some of the South Korean progressive groups to the thinking of Noam Chomsky would perhaps give you the best sense of the kinds of criticism or the kinds of feelings that they have about the United States, and especially about the U.S. military. Opinion polls in many countries show that the American government is actually a lot less light than American culture, American media. Is that the case as well in Korea at the time, or was it an all-encompassing dislike of American-ness? At the time in Korea, I think that the criticism was not actually directed so much about the U.S. government. I think this was a broader reevaluation on the part of the 386 generation of, quote-unquote, what America means to us. Now, the 386 generation were people who were born in the 60s, went to school or college in the 80s, and who were uh, by then in their 30s. And their views were shaped by the events of 1979 and 1980. During this period, the South Korean feelings about the United States were not directed that much toward the United States. I think this was more a reevaluation of what the United States quote unquote means to us South Koreans. It's important to remember that South Koreans were not able to be very critical openly about the United States until democratization took place in 1987 and 1988. And even after that, South Korea was led by two conservative presidents. It was only after the first progressive president was elected in December of 1997, that is Kim Dae-jung, that I think that people critical of the United States, particularly left-wing NGOs, felt empowered to speak out much more openly and much more frankly about how they felt about the U.S. writ large and its relationship with Korea. Now, I said that during this period, Koreans were really not focusing so much on the U.S. government. That's particularly true of the first half of the period that I write about because Bill Clinton was still in office and the Clinton administration was making enormous efforts in fact to address Korean popular and media demands for various changes in the relationship. However, there was a focus on the U.S. government in the second half because that's when George W. Bush was elected president. But by that time, the controversy was not so much over the USFK, it was over Bush's North Korea policy. And here, the real kernel of the conflict was not popular feeling towards George W. Bush, but Kim Dae-jung's administration's conflict policy-wise over North Korea with the George W. Bush administration. Before continuing any further, maybe just at the personal level, how did the diplomatic body actually feel about those demonstrations that mostly happen in Gwangwamun and in front of City Hall, which are both right in front of the American embassy? Well, I'm, I'm sure that most Americans at the embassy and at U.S. Forces Korea felt pretty bad about them. You know, the American self-image is kind of maybe a little bit naive. We like to think that we're the good guys, and especially in Korea, we've helped Korea, and Korea has been a great success story for American foreign policy. So when you feel that way, and yet there are thousands, sometimes 10,000, sometimes even more Koreans protesting outside your front gate, it makes one feel pretty low. What have we done wrong? Why can't we explain? explain ourselves better, why would Koreans feel this way about us? I mean, that's what got me thinking and studying about this and eventually deciding I would like to try to write this down and make sense of it. The cover of your book actually shows a picture of a manifestation on December 14, 2002, probably the biggest anti-American manifestation that ever happened. Of course, at the time you were no longer in Korea, but how did the American-based intelligence corpus and diplomatic corps actually uh, feel about those manifestations from people who were not actually in Korea? 
My impression is that uh, American leaders of the embassy and USFK in South Korea at the time were increasingly frustrated, increasingly demoralized, and probably increasingly angry by this point at the South Korean protest against the United States. But of course, the Americans who head the embassy and U.S. forces Korea, they're paid professionals. And so it's their official responsibility to take punishment <laughs> for the rest of the American people or for American policy. Uh, so they couldn't really say much. But something very interesting in which most Americans and most Koreans don't realize is that during this period, there were some visits by American congressmen and other very senior American political leaders. And when they looked outside their hotel windows and saw these enormous demonstrations and speakers saying terrible things about the United States and the U.S. military and shredding huge American flags, they found it, one, incomprehensible, and two, they were immediately angry because they're not paid <laughs> to just put up with that. And I think their reaction, frankly, was, well, if they don't want us anymore, well, we don't have to stay here. Now, this feeling uh, was quickly discerned by the top-level Koreans that these Americans met. And I think for the first time, top South Korean bureaucrats and maybe some South Korean politicians began to realize, wow, the Americans are actually f looking at this, and they don't understand it, and they're very angry. We may be on the verge of undermining the basis for maintaining the alliance relationship. That energized the top levels in the South Korean government, and I believe that that was one of the things that helped to end this uh, period of severe anti-American feeling. By the end of 2002, however, the public display of anti-Americanism was over, and to quote you, ending almost as suddenly as it had seemed to begin. How do you explain this? Why did it suddenly peter off? It's a very interesting phenomenon, because at the time, the situation was just getting worse and worse, and we Americans had no idea when this would end, or even if it would end, one could imagine it just continuing to get worse until, in fact, the alliance was no longer politically sustainable. But it did end within a matter of almost weeks. I think there were a number of factors at work. These protests took place during the, or, or up to and just after the South Korean presidential campaign. The two main candidates were a progressive, No Mu Hyun, and a conservative, Lee Hui Chang. No Mu Hyun was sort of infamous or famous for being critical of the United States. He had called for the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Korea a decade before. He had famously said uh, that he had not ever visited the United States in his life because he didn't feel a need to kowtow to the United States, and so on. And so it was in the context of this uh, presidential campaign that the Korean media was reporting about USFK and the traffic accident and so forth. Interestingly, No said very little about the United States and the traffic accident. He did not participate in the candlelight protest against U.S. forces Korea during this period. I think that's because he didn't have to. He, was, uh, he knew that the South Korean public regarded him as critical of the United States. On the other hand, his conservative, what many South Koreans like to think of as also pro-American opponent, participated in the candlelight demonstrations, as he saw his poll numbers going down because of the perception that conservatives are pro-American. And he even called in our American ambassador at the time and berated him in front of Korean journalists uh, and demanded another revision of the SOFA agreement, which had taken place only a couple of years before. It was actually quite offensive on a personal level and also if you identify as American with, <laughs> the, with our country as well. That presidential campaign, I think, indirectly gave a lot of oomph to the protest. There were a lot of actors and institutions that wanted to get Noam Hyun elected and they were very active in, behind the scenes in publicizing the South Korean dissatisfaction with the United States. So that was one a very important factor. Second was, when No Mu Hyun, in fact, won the election, probably because of these protests, he personally and politically had no interest 
in controversy with the United States over USFK issues. Like Kim Dae-jung, his focus was on making progress diplomatically with North Korea. And to do that, he needed United States help. So one of the first things he did after being elected was to actually visit U.S. Forces Korea headquarters, and he gave remarks in which he called U.S. Forces Korea precious, <laughs> literally precious to Korea. Then a, a few months later, after No was in office, he quickly became unpopular uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with the United States, but with his background and personality. And that, I think, helped to change the focus, especially of the conservative media, away from U.S. Forces Korea to criticism of No Myohan. And finally, as South Korean conservatives saw the protest in late 2002 and the reaction of Americans both in South Korea but especially in the United States, they became very concerned that the alliance might eventually collapse. Their fears were probably heightened by the election of No Myohan. And so South Korean conservative civil society began organizing and trying to counterbalance left-wing civil society organizations. They had began having large-scale protests against progressive causes. So this changed the media's narrative. It shifted the storyline completely away from U.S. forces Korea toward more of a domestic focus on differences between the left and right in South Korea. After Noh Myung's election, did anti-Americanism linger, maybe not as the main focus of public discourse, but latent? For example, in 2004, I believe, Tsai, famous for Opa Gangnam Style, actually went on stage and destroyed a tank model, a U.S. tank model, uh, which actually became a controversy afterwards. Was that just an isolated event, something related to Tsai, or was it more cultural still? It did, in fact, linger for two or three years after 2002, in part because of the controversy over North Korea policy between George W. Bush and President Noh Myohan. And also, as we all recall, the U.S. Uh, under George W. Bush's leadership was pretty much universally criticized during this period uh, because of the invasion of, if not so much Afghanistan, the invasion and occupation of Iraq. So that's kind of a different context uh, for some of the anti-American feelings that were still around in 2004 when Tsai performed in that concert. But to give you a sense of what was politically acceptable at the time, still in South Korea, at this concert, Tsai not only took a model of the kind of vehicle that killed the poor schoolgirls in 2002 and flung it on the floor, smashed it on the floor, he also, I believe at that time, sang the song, uh, was it entitled Dear Americans or something? I uh, put it in the book. It's extremely vulgar and extremely hostile. It says explicitly, we should kill those Americans who are torturing. We should kill those Americans who I believe are in Iraq or something like that. Of course, after Sai became world famous and especially popular in the United States for Gangnam style, uh, somebody dug this up, and I'm sure Sai had a moment of panic, but uh, his advisors got him to issue a, a, a long apology saying, I, I'm really sorry about this, I'm sorry to have offended, but you must understand this happened in the context of a different time. So yes, indeed, it was a context. In your book, you probe deeper for the origins of anti-Americanism and argue, and I'm quoting, that in many ways it is associated with Koreans' own self-image. Could you maybe elaborate on it some more? During the past hundred years or so, the Korean nation has suffered so many traumas, and they have developed a narrative about themselves and about others that basically consists of South Korea being a victim of major powers. And while, in fact, most South Koreans have pretty good feelings toward the United States, especially these days, when they look at the United States, they also tend to see the U.S. as being like other foreign powers, willing at times to take advantage of the Korean people, just as other big powers have historically. So that's why I say that South Korean people, sense of their own identity has some significant connection with the way they look at the United States. But it's not just the United States, it's also with China and Japan and others. Does that mean that those roots are actually persistent and that we could see anti-Americanism flaring up again uh, in a few years if something happened? 
A, a number of the factors that went into this sort of perfect storm of anti-American feeling that we saw over a decade ago remain. Uh, these include South Korean media dynamics in which both conservative and progressive media will get on an issue and write it to death and compete to, to be more sensational. Another aspect is the deep division between progressives and conservatives in South Korea, which tends to politicize issues, uh, among them the U.S. relationship and the U.S. military presence. And, of course, a significant minority of South Koreans continue to be quite critically inclined toward the United States. That said, I do not expect there to be an exact repeat of what we saw 15 years ago. I think, in part, the phenomenon then was a venting of steam because people critical of the U.S. had not been able to be that critical openly about it before, and they certainly took advantage of it. Uh, so a lot of that steam has gone out. Moreover, the South Korean government and U.S. military and embassy officials felt badly burned by that, and they uh, focus even more attention on trying to make sure that they minimize any crime or incidents involving American forces, and that when uh, anything happens that they try to work together uh, and talk to the Korean media right away and, and do as good a good job as they can to mitigate uh, potential controversies. But since some of these factors uh, in anti-Americanism still remain, we could still have big controversies involving the United States in South Korea. I mention in my book that at this point, the best guess I can make is that we might again have a big controversy over North Korea policy when another progressive is elected to the Blue House. Uh, these days, neither American Democrats nor Republicans would support strongly a sunshine policy approach. But I'm pretty convinced that progressives in South Korea, when they take back the Blue House, will pursue probably a strengthened sunshine policy. The other risk of major misunderstandings that could result in strong anti-American feelings is how the rivalry and competition between the United States and the PRC plays out. Koreans are acutely sensitive about this. They tend to feel that conflict of some sort is almost inevitable between the U.S. and China. I think that's a gross uh, misreading or exaggeration and that they are trapped or sandwiched between these two superpowers and they're kind of helpless. That's why there's a tremendous sensitivity in South Korea to the issue of American missile defense here and some other issues of controversy between the U.S. and China. But even there on balance, I think most South Koreans, including many progressives, still feel that they want to maintain the alliance with the United States they see a lot of opportunities in their interaction with China, but they're a little nervous about China, what it may do as it develops and how its political system and political problems may play out. So I think the most of, uh, Koreans tend to see the United States for some time to come as a security blanket, an insurance policy. Not only in Korea, but in many other countries, American foreign policy has been criticized as being at time arrogant or hypocritical. To what extent do you think that American foreign policy in South Korea have led to anti-Americanism? And to what extent is it rather domestic issues? Well, the U.S. certainly can be and has been arrogant and hypocritical at times um, in all places, including Korea. Of course, that's not unique to Americans. Uh, it's probably more evident when Americans do it because the United States is usually more powerful than the country it's dealing with, and the United States is, quote, number one, unquote, in international society, and, and no matter what area, we always focus more on number one than number two, much less number 10. There is a narrative in South Korea that South Korean criticism of the United States it is not anti-American that it is simply criticism of misguided or uh, wrong-headed American policies. And uh, certainly one can find examples, I think, of that. But I think the Koreans say that more because they have this sense that the word anti-Americanism suggests emotionalism or irrationality. And of course, no one wants to be accused of being emotional or irrational. 
and so they say that protests in uh, 1999 to 2002 were not anti-Americanism. It might have been, they would say, anti-American feelings, but it's not ideological anti-Americanism. It was criticism of the United States for specific policies, for specific actions. But I've tried to push back against that somewhat in my book. In fact, the book tries to counter several narratives. The first one is that South Koreans were simply reacting to American misbehavior or wrong policies. The second is that the U.S. officials at the time were uh, incompetent or unable to be sensitive to South Korean concerns and therefore made the situation worse. We'll see if this has any impact on anyone's thinking. More than 10 years later, do you actually believe that the American side had things wrong, that they had different, they committed different mistakes when dealing with the South Korean attitude at the turn of the century? Honestly, I don't think that the U.S. during that period did anything particularly bad to Korea. And as I said in the book, that many of these incidents and issues were either taken out of context or exaggerated. Certainly at different times over the decades, American soldiers have committed crimes in South Korea, but human beings commit crimes. There, there's a minimum to which one can reduce all crimes and incidents involving American personnel. If you want American crime to be the sole criterion by which you judge U.S. forces Korea, and don't accept that, you know, occasionally, no matter what your best efforts are, that there will be some crime, then basically you're saying, well, U.S. forces must be removed from Korea. And in fact, I think that is the ulterior motive of some of the groups that are being so critical of U.S. forces Korea. In hindsight, if we had known then at the American Embassy and U.S. forces Korea what we know now, we would have done some things differently. I think we would have made much more outspoken apologies, uh, lengthier apologies, made more dramatic gestures to try to get ahead of all of this anti-American feeling. But again, in fact, we did quite a bit. It's just that the South Korean feelings toward the American military were so harsh at the time that it was very difficult to get ahead. And almost everything that we said to the South Korean media was immediately discounted as too little, too late, insincere. Now, there are things that U.S. military has done over the years that I'm critical of. I think that U.S. military hung on too long to its golf course at its Yongsan headquarters. I, and I sympathize with people who have a favorite sport and want to be able to indulge. But politically, that was really a killer for the U.S., and yet the generals wanted to keep their golf course. It took a long time and a lot of arm twisting by the American embassy to dissuade them. Another thing that has occasionally been looked at by the Korean media, but which is kind of a scandal, is at least until recently, U.S. forces had a little mini casino at their rest and recreation hotel for their uh, military personnel in Seoul. And they were supposed to keep South Korean citizens out, but apparently large numbers of South Korean citizens came in, and that was a way that the U.S. military learned, uh, earned a, a lot of cash, which it turned back into the restroom recreation facilities and, and morale-boosting programs for its personnel. So it was put to a good cause, but this is contrary to South Korean law, and we shouldn't have done it. Perhaps we're still doing it today. So it seems that at the time, South Korea and the United States were not really able to understand each other properly. Fifteen years later, is it better? Do the two countries understand themselves better on such issues? I think that the United States and South Korean governments do have a much better understanding of the, how they each has to deal and look at these issues than we did before, partly because we had such a confrontation then that forces you uh, on both sides to try to understand it better. But I think we should not exaggerate this. Again, as I wrote in the book, the U.S. military and the U.S. embassy was pretty sensitive and understanding of what was going on. It's just that the mood in South Korea was so hostile that our efforts to schmooze and explain and rationalize were actually offensive to most Koreans. 
One of the main changes is that for the past 10 years or so, South Korea has been led by conservative governments. And the conservative governments are more sensitive to the need to manage these issues than progressive governments were, at, at least initially. I think the No Mu Hyun government in its later years, at least the military under No Mu Hyun in his later years, did a better job of working with USFK to deal with these issues. In conclusion, what should be done, what could be improved to avoid a recurrence of anti-Americanism in South Korea? There are many things that probably should be done. I think the United States needs to uh, maintain and strengthen its roster of people with significant Korea experience and make sure that a significant percentage of them are in fairly high positions so their voice can be heard. I think that South Korean government needs to do more to educate the South Korean people about the alliance, including such aspect, technical aspects of it as the status of forces agreement. Even to this day, a huge majority, probably 90% of South Koreans, are convinced that the status of forces agreement is unfair to Koreans. And I try to argue in the book that there's just no objective reason for, for believing that. But this is kind of technical, and it takes a little study, and it's kind of hard to teach an entire nation, you know, something that abstract. But Koreans, to the extent that Koreans do want the alliance to continue, they need to try to understand better American feelings as well as their own. Unfortunately, they're not going to get very much help from the American people. The United States has so many overseas military commitments that the American people just can't keep up with them. So the American people had virtually no idea of what was going on in South Korea in terms of anti-Americanism during this entire period from 1999 until the very end of 2002, when the protest in South Korea became so big that it finally did get the attention of the American people. And the American people were completely puzzled as to why South Koreans would be reacting so emotionally and so strongly about a traffic accident. So it's very ironic. I talk about it in the book as an asymmetry of public attention to the alliance. And I argue that this is sort of a cautionary note or a lesson for the American people that if even in an alliance so relatively successful as the U.S.-South Korea alliance, there are so many misunderstandings and difficulties and so much effort has to go into just maintaining and managing the alliance, then it's madness to have thought, for example, that we could invade and occupy and transform Iraq. Absolute madness. Maybe on the last note, how has your book received so far in Korea? You write that Koreans don't like to be branded as anti-Americans. So how did that go? Well, it has only been published in English so far. It's possible that it will be published in Korean, at which point we might have a better sense of how Koreans react to it. I've only had a few Koreans read it and and comment to me on it. Uh, Some of the comments are quite interesting. One dear uh, old friend, an intellectual, told me, well, I guess one could look at things from that angle. She was obviously trying to be diplomatic and still skeptical about my interpretation or my narrative of these events because they're so contrary to the narrative that South Korean people had at the time and and still do to some extent. Another reaction I've gotten from uh, some Korean Americans is, um, uh, we understand that, that uh, yes, we agree, but by the way, don't say anti-Americanism, say anti-American sentiments. And of course, the whole book is, uh, one of the points of the book is, uh, no, in fact, there is some something one, a reasonable person might call anti-Americanism, or at least elements of anti-Americanism in South Korea. I, I wrote this in the first instance for an American audience because I thought that because there is this asymmetry of public attention and the Americans generally know so much less about the alliance than the South Koreans that maybe at least a few Americans would read this and and have a better understanding not only of the U.S.-Korea relationship but of what it's like trying to (laughs) maintain this uh, American presence, um, especially military presence overseas. David Straub, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. My pleasure. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, 
subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.